Hey guys, how are you doing? I want you to taste things before anything. And I want you to keep things in mind. Everything here has got a letter. But what we have here is some different olive oils with uh, the atar seasoning. So it's like thyme, sumac, sesame, salt. But the crackers are gluten-free in case you happen to be gluten-free, the bread is bread. But just take a sample of each one of the olive oils and just keep a note, write down which one you like the most or maybe just notes about each one. Maybe you like all of them. And then I'd like you to try some of the roasted garlic and they are also lettered. You, I've provided butter knives if you wanna smear them on bread instead of just popping it in your mouth. And then likewise, make some notes about that. Or is there one that you like better? Can you tell a difference? So go ahead. Manger. <laughs> it's okay if you wanna just like chunk off a little bit of the garlic. You don't have to eat a whole clove. Although the skeeters probably won't like you as much if you do. Can you tell a difference in the olive oils? Yes? Good. A little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. The point of this activity is trying to demonstrate that different fats have different flavors inherent. And we're going to kind of go into that later. But I just wanted you to go ahead and taste now because I think it's kind of nice to feed you right when you arrive. And then just be thinking about it, rolling it around in your mouth as we start. The fourth olive oil I was going to bring was one that I bought today off of the shelf at a store that will be unnamed, although it's not different than any other store, and it's actually rancid. Not rancid, so rancid that it's unsellable. It's just that most people in the United States are used to eating rancid olive oil. And so the market actually saves the rancid product for us <laughs> because we're so uneducated about the inherent flavors of fats. Was it an American olive oil? Yeah, it was a Californian. But one of the three of these is a Californian as well, and it is not rancid. I wanted you to taste it, <laughs> especially on, next to these. Sesame oil, you can definitely taste mm -hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Canola oil always tastes rancid. Is this the same seasoning in all three? Yes, it is. And I don't even know if it will work, if the test will work, but you never know until you try. That's a big difference. Big difference. Uh-huh. So I suppose I should officially introduce myself while we're still tasting. My name is Meredith. I work here at Living Web Farms. We're a research and demonstration educational nonprofit organization. We own three properties here in the Mills River area. They're not contiguous, but very close to here. And we raise all kinds of good food from A to Z organic vegetables to pastured livestock, eggs, and we offer year-round education on the way that we do that, demonstrating ways to homestead or farm commercially, and we also offer education on alternative energy and cooking, which is what we're here to do tonight. I coordinate the education program, um, so I'm in charge of the adult education that goes on year-round here, and I also work with the livestock part-time and teach I would say the majority of the cooking education that goes on here. When we do full day workshops, we offer a meal from the farm. So I am part of the team that makes that happen. When I'm not working here at the farm, I am an author of two books. They are about meat and I travel around in that world cooking and teaching people about meat raised with integrity and supply chain dynamics that support farmers. And so my interest in this particular topic kind of stems from the fact that as I have furthered my culinary education, I've sort of settled on some fundamental things about cooking that were not handed to me when I was first taught how to cook. And so in building the cooking education here at the farm, we decided sometime last year that we wanted to offer a series of classes on the back to basics, four fundamental essentials of cooking is what we're calling this series. We've done salt. Some of you may have been at that class. We did cooking with fire and examining the role of heat. We are going to be doing later this year the role of acid in the kitchen, and then today is cooking with fat. I kind of have an ambitious agenda in terms of um, demonstrations tonight, but, but hopefully we will we'll get to it all. Uh, I wanted to kind of start by talking about like the sciencey side of fats. So we might do a little reaching back to your seventh grade chemistry class, which will be a lot of fun. Um, but basically, fats are one of the four fundamental food molecules, water, protein, carbohydrates, and fat. Right? And what makes fat so unique and how we use it in the kitchen relates to how it's structured and how it interacts with those other, its other three cohorts, basically, in that group. And so I thought we would spend a little bit of time looking at kind of what are fats, how are they built, 
And why do they behave the way that they behave? And why are they varied in the way that they are varied? And I want to keep that kind of quick, but a lot of this dovetails with like the health implications of fat in our diet. And so I know there might be some questions. And so quickly, um, fats are part of a group of organic compounds called li lipids. And lipids are broad, so we won't cover them very closely. But the subsection of lipids that fats belong to are called the glycerides. Right? And so if you remember this, or if anybody here is a scientist and might be smarter than me about this, please don't embarrass me. But basically glycerides are um, a glycerol molecule and they have the ability to like hitch on to these carbon hydrogen chains. And they can fit up to three on the carboxyl group or the glycerol. So the chain, the carbon hydrogen chain is called the glyceride chain. So this is where we get the name a triglyceride, a diglyceride, or a monoglyceride. It's how many glycerides are attached to that carboxyl group, and it's wagoning them around in solution or wherever it is, right? This would be a triglyceride, right? So this here, the little dots, are we're calling the carboxyl group, and then this kinky chains that come off are the carbon-hydrogen chains, the glyceride chains. All right, and so if all these carbons stretched out here are all linked to hydrogens, nice and uniform, then we call it a saturated fat, okay? Because all the carbon bonds are filled up with hydrogen atoms, all right? If a fat actually ends up somewhere with a double carbon bond, then it will kink and then continue bonding with more carbons and more hydrogens. But right there where that double bond is means that it's got some extra off of the carbon that's here and the carbon that's here. It's got some extra hydrogens hanging out there that are available for bonding somewhere else. And the carbons are not fully saturated with hydrogen, so we call it an unsaturated fat. All right, and then, so however many double bonds there are, relates to whether it's a mono unsaturated fat, one double bond, versus a polyunsaturated fat, more than one double bond, okay? So why does this matter? Well, it matters for a few reasons. When a bunch of these guys get together in a friendly group, these triglycerides or even a monoglyceride that's completely saturated and nice and straight, they're able to bond together quite easily. We call it zippering, and you can see why, because they can fit just nice and neatly together like puzzle pieces. So as a result, saturated fats are more solid, they're more structured, right? And they um, are more stable in a lot of ways. So when we get into talking about smoke point, right, and the things that we think about when cooking with fat and choosing fats, that will make a lot more sense, all right? And when we get into unsaturated fats with their kinky designs, and they can be kinked down or they can be kinked up, but they won't zipper together quite as easily as the saturated fats, and that's what lends to those types of fats or oils being more liquidy and less stable, and sometimes having a lower smoke point because there's more susceptibility to bonding with things that are going on in other, the rest of the food or in the atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Okay, further, most vegetable oils are made up of some of this and some of this, okay? And then some vegetable oils, you know, like coconut oil and a lot of animal fats are mostly all this, which is why they're more solid at room temperature and the vegetable oil is more liquid at room temperature. And so we're not gonna try to be really exhaustive throughout the night calling fats, fats, and oils, oils. We're gonna call them all fats because they're all made up of different glyceride groups, all right? So don't let that confuse you. The other thing that happens though is back in the 50s and 60s when the sugar industry did a whole bunch of work to implicate fat and the health problems that we started to see in our country, Everyone was taught to go for the unsaturated fats, right? Because saturated fat was the evil thing that was causing cholesterol to rise and causing heart problems. We have since found out that it's quite the opposite, that actually too many carbohydrates and simple sugars in our diets are leading to, to heart disease and health problems and obesity, and that the saturated fats are actually something that belong in our bodies, obviously in moderation. But what happened at that point is everybody started work, wanting to work with these unsaturated fats but then running into issues because of the way that they are built, right? We can't slice off a slab of olive oil, you know, I mean, maybe a very high quality olive oil, if it was cold, you could, but you know, a canola oil is always gonna be a liquid. So we started doing this thing called hydrogenation. Okay, so that's when we take these unsaturated molecules and we hit them with some kind of catalyst, not important, and a whole bunch of high heat and all kinds of hydrogen atoms. So we overwhelm the molecules with hydrogen atoms 
forcing some of the bonds to rearrange so that that glyceride is then saturated with hydrogen atoms and the fat becomes straight, right, or saturated. And then it behaves, obviously, like a more stable saturated fat. But the other thing that happens when we hydrogenate fats is that some of the unsaturated fats, rather than the bonds rearranging and the fats actually becoming saturated, this double bond will flip over and twist. Okay, and that's what we call a trans fat. Okay, so that makes the fat long and straight so that it behaves like a saturated fat. But in reality, that double bond is still there and those free hydrogens are still there and those free carbons are still there. So it's actually an unsaturated fat that's behaving like a saturated fat biochemically. All right, so what's wrong with that? Well, your cell membranes are made out of lipids, right? <laughs> that's what makes animals unique in one way is that they have a phospholipid layer surrounding their cells rather than a starchy cell wall like a plant. And that cell membrane is responsible not only for insulation, but also for exchange. So if we have trans fats coming in, lodging in, they fit perfectly right there where the saturated fats are supposed to go into the cell walls. And we get problems with nutrient and enzyme exchange. And we also get problems with structure. So structure of our arteries. And we'll also get problems with the buildup of plaque. Okay, so this is why trans fats are implicated now in nutrition science as well as outside of it as things to avoid. Now we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on that because this is about whole foods cooking and how to use fat in whole foods cooking and you're not going to be hydrogenating fats in your kitchen. The, the key there is just to avoid processed and packaged foods, especially if they contain partially hydrogenated oils or hydrogenated oils um, because those are most certainly trans fat heavy. And then in the kitchen, focusing on using pure fats as much as you can, and particularly vegetable fats that have some measure of saturated fat and then healthy unsaturated fats like linoleic acid, right? Oleic acid, these are the things that we're used to hearing as good things. And I think a lot of times now as people are re-educating, they're like, oh, unsaturated fats are bad because that's where the trans fats come from. No, it's only the hydrogenated unsaturated fats, right? So. Omega-3, omega-6, omega-9 fatty acids, those are all the products of unsaturated fat compounds. So it's okay and good, and in many cases essential to have unsaturated fats in your diet. And this is why olive oil is good for us, this is why sunflower oil is okay, because it has a nice combination of the saturated and healthy unsaturated fats. I will provide my class notes online after the class, so you can go and read back on things. And in that, there's a link to the New York Times article that came out in 2016 called How the Sugar Industry Shifted Blame to Fat. If you're interested in reading more about that and links to the actual peer-reviewed research that they kind of covered up for about 50 years, then you can go down that rabbit hole as much as you want, but we're not going to take a lot of time to do that now. All right, so we're not going to demo all these fats, but I thought we would talk about the fats that kind of are considered healthy fats to use in the kitchen. So animal fats like lard, tallow, duck fat, or schmaltz, which is chicken fat. Vegetable fats that are high in, in saturated fat are healthy unsaturated fat, so that's olive oil. Sunflower oil, particularly high oleic sunflower oil, sesame oil and coconut oil. And there are other vegetable fats like avocado oil, walnut oil, scallion oil that are also good, but they're, they tend to be a little bit more expensive and more specialized, which we'll talk about as well. So I'm kind of just mentioning now like the main players. And then whole fat dairy products are also considered fats that we use in cooking. So like yogurts, cheeses, butter, ghee or clarified butter, cream, buttermilk, stuff like that. So smoke point, we'll just go over that briefly before we make food. We're doing great. We talked about it a little bit before. So smoke point has to do with the different levels of saturated, unsaturated, the different glycerides that come together to make up a fat. So We've done some very, very brief chemistry, but you can imagine the infinite combinations of different glycerides, both mono, poly, unsaturated, you know, trans and cis, all these things that can come together to give all the different oils and fats that we have in the world their different characters and behaviors and flavors, right? So you can go crazy and down that rabbit hole researching that as well. But the variation within the fats chemically has to do with how they hold up in the presence of heat. And that's where we get to smoke point, right? Very important when choosing the fat or the oil that you're cooking with. And it basically just refers to the moment at which the bonds start to denature or decompose because they've been exposed to a certain amount of heat. So those bonds in the glyceride groups or in some of the other bonds that are there. So in general, 
the more free fatty acids that are in the mix of the oil, the lower the smoke point. Um, and you can look up, I think Serious Eats did a post, if you're familiar with that blog or website, they did a post on smoke point and they have a nice table in there of the average smoke point of most oils that you'll find in a kitchen. And it's funny because when I was reading about like scientifically, there were these generalizations saying that unsaturated fats generally have a lower smoke point than saturated fats, which makes sense, right? Because we learn that they don't zip together as well and they're generally less stable. But it turns out that if you look at a table like that, there actually are some unsaturated fats that have a higher smoke point than saturated fats. And it could be because they have enough mix of saturated fats in there that they're able to, to hold um, a little bit longer. But in general, sort of, unsaturated fats will have a lower smoke point than saturated fats. Vegetable fats lower than animal fats. Um, unrefined oils will sometimes have a lower smoke point than refined oils because they have more minerals and enzymes and compounds in them that are very, very good for your health. But, you know, they may um, bond to things in the atmosphere or get a little volatile in the presence of heat. And so this is why, you know, really distinctive unrefined oils like a walnut oil or something are great for using raw in salad dressings and stuff like that. But the cooking oils, we tend to focus on the few that I mentioned earlier. Um, old oil, if it's been introduced to a smoke point before, will have a lower subsequent smoke point every time. So if you're one of those people who saves your frying oil and reuses it, there's nothing wrong with that, but you'll just know that it's going to hit that smoke point sooner. And there's really, I mean, there's not something inherently wrong with coming to smoke point, but what it can do is denature bonds and just totally change the flavor of the fat. And so you're going to end up with your food tasting bitter, acrid, or just unlike what you wanted it to taste like. And the other thing that can happen if oil hits a smoke point is you can create what we call free radicals, which are basically loose bonds out there waiting to bond to whatever in the world comes their way, which can be harmful in your body. If there's something in your body that that bond wants to grab, um, or if there's something in the atmosphere, the cooking atmosphere, that that bond wants to grab. So in general, if, if a oil hits smoke point, it's really best to just take it off the heat and then taste it as it cools figure out whether it's um, tasting bitter or something. Um, and then you decide if you wanna ingest a few free radicals and <laughs> save the oil. But in general, if I bring an oil to smoke point, I will cool the pan, wipe it out, start all over again. Um, all right, so um, the other thing you can do to prolong smoke point is that the less contact the fat has with the atmosphere as it's heating, the less chance that it has of hitting its smoke point. So for frying, we use narrower, taller pans so that there's less air hitting the surface. Um, okay, so moving on from all that chemistry stuff we talk about, I wanna, what I want this class to be about is the role of fat in cooking. How do we use it? How do we manipulate it specifically to alter flavor and to alter texture? So the role of fat in flavor, well, one, it's because of the bonds it has, it bonds to other aroma compounds. So besides the inherent flavor that each fat has itself, it will actually grab up and carry other flavors. And then because it's so viscous, it will actually prolong them, right? Either in the dish or on your tongue. So it's coating your tongue and it's allowing you to enjoy those aromas and compounds longer than if there wasn't a fat present. So it's a, I guess it's a carrier as well as its own flavor so the reason I brought these olive oils is because I've been really fascinated recently to learn, A, that most olive oils sold in America, even the extra virgin, super expensive ones are often kind of the dregs in terms of the, what the world is, is consuming. Um, and so I, I went to the olive oil store in Asheville and I chose three I wanted one that was like an early harvest that would be nice and mild, and I wanted one that would be sort of in the middle, and then one that would be actually a little bit like peppery or piquant. Um, and then, and so I put them out, and I just wanted to A, see if you could tell a difference, and B, see if you had a preference. Does anyone have thoughts on that? I thought A was really smooth, uh -huh. whereas I went down the line, the last one I said was bitter. Uh -huh. Yeah, I can see what you mean by that. Other thoughts? You like the last one the best. And so a lot of it is subjective. It should be mild for sure. It was, it was, like, it was like the ultra light. Uh-huh, yeah. It was like, it was like um, 
Make a so it felt fla- it felt flavorless to you. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's a little floral, isn't it? For three. Oh, interesting. I can see that. Yeah, I would say two and three have more similarities than two the the, the B and the C have with A. Um, what about the garlic? Did you t- could you tell a difference in the garlic? Did you? It was awful. Yeah, it was too. Like spicier? It was just very strong, 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 strong. Uh-huh. And then the other two were milder to you? Yeah, I saw the other way around. The other way around. He melted like nothing in my mouth. So that's just so interesting how we all taste this. So that was one point of the exercise is that no one's going to experience it the same way. But number two is that you might use the olive oils in the different ways, right? So the, all the garlics, the difference in the garlics is that they were each roasted in one of the olive oils, but the letters don't correspond. So the, uh, I, brought, I brought the bottle so you guys could see it. And if you go to their website, I haven't, I haven't spent a lot of time at the store, Olive and Kicking in Asheville, but, um, but they have a, a big range of stuff. And I just picked three. Um, but the, the Pequal is this very, like, piquant one, and it, I believe it comes from Chile. The Arbosana is a Californian early harvest, very mild olive oil, and then this Nocellar is an Italian, um, kind of middle of the road. Um, but the idea is that the Arbosana and mild olive oils like that are more for drizzling or for salad dressings and things like that, that that the mild flavor is meant to pair with other flavors and not mask them, right? And that the stronger you get, the more it's used for cooking. And so I was just curious, I went ahead and roasted the garlic because I was like, I wonder if it would change, like if you liked the flavor of one of these better, would it change if the thing was cooked, right? If the oil had been heated. Um, And I mean, one thing I hear is that like, okay, well the olive oil itself didn't taste great, but it didn't enough like counterbalance the flavor of the garlic and the garlic was like, whoa, for the, because the, that A in the oil is C in the garlic, which is interesting, right? It's strong garlic. So what was yeah. the, so that's the garlic that I made. It let the garlic come through. You tasted the garlic more because the olive oil itself was not as flavorful. So A was the piqual. The only one that was the same was nochilara. B and B. Butter, no taste. Yeah. Yeah. It's so smooth, but third one's sharp. Right. So it's like, I mean, it's both a little disappointing and also exciting to know that olive oil is not olive oil is not olive oil, right? That you choose, and that similarly, you choose your fat based on what result you want to have. And, um, you know, you're not going to cook a sweet cake with pork fat. And you're not going to make an Asian stir fry with olive oil, right? That doesn't make sense. So as you go around the world, you see different applications of different types of fats based on the types of flavors we associate with food. So one of the biggest things that students that I come in contact with in my culinary classes is like, oh, I really want to learn how to cook Korean food. And I really want to learn how to cook Indian food. And it's like, well, what fat are you using? You know, are you using a coconut oil to cook the Indian food? I certainly hope you are using ghee or coconut oil. For your Asian food, I hope you're using scallion and sesame and stuff like that, you know. Italian is where the olive oils and and stuff come in. And in France, it's more butter and cream and um, duck fat and things like that. So they're really, it's really going to characterize the food. And a lot of times... Um, also, people don't realize that they're using rancid oils in their food and then wondering why they're getting a substandard result. So that was sort of the point of that activity. And please feel free to help yourself to more of this because there's obviously more. I just wanted to mention browning reactions before we move on to texture. Um, well, browning does have to do with texture. But if you've ever heard of the Maillard reaction, caramelization is separate from the Maillard reaction. But the both of those are considered browning chemical reactions that occur only at temperatures above 230 Fahrenheit. And water vaporizes before it reaches that temperature. So what allows us to get a good sear on things and get nice browning reactions is fat-based cooking mediums, right? So um, 
obviously different fats will lend different flavors to foods, but browning reactions actually bring a totally different class of flavors into food that isn't inherent to the food itself. So that's really interesting. And if you kind of think about it for a second, you're like, oh yeah, well all the foods that I know of that are cooked in water don't get brown. Like steamed foods, boiled foods, you know, stuff like that are not gonna get that flavor. If you use sous vide cooking, you, you know that it's often recommended to sous vide the item and then pull it out and sear it because it's not gonna have that yummy umami that comes from browning reactions or that delicious look to it if you don't induce those Maillard um, cascades that happen when we get heat above 230. Um, so that's great. The other thing is that, you know, fat is, it's a nonpolar molecule, water's a polar molecule, and so as we know, they don't mix. And so the, the good thing about that is that when we want to exclude water, like when we're trying to brown something, fat helps us with that job, right? Um, so, questions at this point? Okay. So I wanna go on to the texture part, which is about fat's chemical composition, the way it interacts with water and protein to influence the way we cook and the decisions that we make in the kitchen. So crispness, we've also, we've kind of forayed here already. Fat helps us make food crispy because it's the only thing we can cook food in that allows us to get temperatures that high. And why is that? Well, those glyceride chains can be very, 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 very long. They only have to be three carbons long to be qualified as a glyceride, but they can be quite long indeed. And even though the bonds that they make with each other are weaker than the bonds in water, there are more of them because of those big chains. This is what makes oils and fats more viscous than water. But it also means that those bonds and those masses of glyceride molecules can absorb way more energy before something happens to them, right? Which is why fat can withstand more heat than water can um, and why it makes such a good cooking medium. Dry surfaces that way, great. And we get browning reactions as a result. We get the evaporation of water from food surface cells and we get crispy textured food. So what does that mean? It means anything you do in the kitchen that introduces water back into the cooking. Say so you have a pan full of beautiful crispy potatoes and then you throw a lid on it. What's gonna happen? You're gonna get condensation and then the water's gonna drip back on the food and it's gonna end up soggy. Um, everybody knows what happens when we overcrowd the pan, right? We're trapping water on the surface of the food and in between the food molecules and it's not able to evaporate off um, and so we're getting soggy food. Any food, and particularly very spongy food, if we put it in the pan before the oil is hot enough to start cooking it, it absorbs the oil instead of drying the surface and making the food crispy. All right, so that's why, that's why people will say always heat the oil before you put the food in. Try to avoid the smoke point, obviously, and then add the food. Don't overcrowd it. And then once you've reached the texture you want, think about the role of water, you know, in whether you're gonna be able to maintain that texture or not. Um, also, when I'm frying, I always make a point to, a lot of people say, well, take the fried green tomato or the fried mushroom or whatever out and put it on a plate or a paper towel. I mean, it's just like that soggy inducing situation because it's either gonna be sitting in its own oil or it's gonna be sitting against that paper towel and it's gonna build up, you know, and sweat. So what I do is I get a sheet pan like this and I'll put a drying rack on top of it and then I'll turn the food out onto that. The way it drips, there's space flowing or air flowing all around it and it remains crispier. Um, okay, perfect timing, moving on to flakiness. Okay, so fat helps increase space between proteins and starches. If it can take the place of water, then it creates what we know as flakiness, all right? So fascinating little thing that I love when people are like, oh, I just can't get my pie crust to be flaky or I, you know, whatever, don't understand how it works in bread. The issue is gluten. So when we put flour and water together, we create gluten, which is a chain of proteins that's created from hydrogen bonds in water and then proteins that already exist in flour. Um, and what helps that reaction is salt, but what inhibits that reaction is fat as well as sugar. All right, so if fat can get in there and surround the water molecules and surround some of the glutamine and glutenine that's in the flour, then the gluten can't form, and more importantly, it can't link up one upon one upon one and make huge, a huge gluten network. So if we're making bread, 
you know, a bread like uh, a super leavened bread, like a sourdough um, boule or something that you'll see, like a, a market bread. Very often, that's just ye or salt, flour, and water. And they're working it or letting it sit and so that those hydrogen bonds can form and so that the gluten network can form. And, but then when you're making a brioche, right, a sweet, moist bread, you're going to see the introduction of sugar. You're going to see the introduction of eggs, butter. These are fat sources that are going to make the bread softer. And when we move on to making pastry, which we're going to do a couple of tonight, you'll see that the different character of the fats that we use affects the character of the dough. So if we want dough to have layers in it, if we want it to flake, then we need to get the fat in between the layers and we need to make sure the fat is as cold as possible. Often we're baking using, making pastry using butter, right? Well, butter is an emulsification, which we'll get to, of water and cream. And so it in itself has water in it. But if we stick that pie crust in the oven and the water evaporates off immediately, the fat remains in between the protein layers and allows them to lift apart, okay? This is why when you're making a pie crust, they say chill the, you know, the bowl, chill the butter, uh, work it as little as possible, right? Because the warmth from our hands is contributing to the smearing of that fat and the melting of the water out of butter's emulsification, which is gonna encourage gluten to form. That's what makes a pie crust tough. Salt de helps develop gluten, right? So we use unsalted butter to encourage or discourage gluten networks. And one of the things I do, this is just two cups of flour and a pinch of salt in here. And then one of the things I do is I use a box grater so that I can cut the butter in to the pieces that it needs to be in. Very quickly, I'm not touching anything. It's just falling out of here, it's very cold. And then I have to work this dough quite a little bit. I barely have to touch it in order for the butter to be in the size particles that it needs to be. If you make a proper, if you, when you're rolling out a properly made pie dough, you should be able to see the chunks of butter in it, right? It shouldn't be overworked. But we do want it to be moist enough. We want to develop some amount of gluten, right? Because we do want it to have a little bit of structure to it. So it's, a, it's, it's the trick of balancing timing, temperature, and how much you work it. All with the aim of keeping the fat as cold as you possibly can. And don't ever put your pie dough or your biscuit that you want to be flaky into the oven unless it's already preheated, right? Because we want that water to evaporate off super fast. So working quickly, the colder your hands are, the better. And this is why pastry chefs use crazy techniques and work in cold rooms and work on marble and things like that because they want their doughs to be super cold and their fats to remain super cold. All right. This is not a scientific uh, measurement of water. And if I was really on top of it, I would be using ice water. A lot of people use vodka. Can anyone guess why? It evaporates. It's also not water. So it's not gonna be, it's an alcohol. So it's not gonna be forming gluten networks the way that water would be. So you're gonna get a flakier crust, right? So three to five tablespoons in general of water into this dough. And you know, you might have to add more because it all stuck to your hand like mine did. And then you're gonna mix it, ideally not with your hand, but with a spoon or something, um, just until the dough holds together. Yeah, totally. How much flour do you use? I use two cups. And um, there's a great technique too that you can get super cold water into a, like a spray bottle. And you can just sit there and spritz it. And that way you're adding water very slowly and methodically and you're not gonna over, overdo it. So once we get it into a ball, we're gonna wanna chill it. The reason for that being we want to re-solidify the fat network so that we can encourage the dough to be nice and 
flaky. And a lot of pastry doughs that you make will keep for a while in the freezer. So if you want to go ahead and pre-make them and stick them in the freezer, you can make a few portions of pastry dough ahead of time, keep them in your freezer. And then when you're ready to make a tart or whatever, you can get home from the farmer's market. It's not so much effort. Okay. So we'll be done with that for a little bit. We'll let it chill and then we'll roll it out. Um, the other thing I want to show you is the shortbread because this is where we can use fat to help us make things very moist and tender, right? So um, shortbread is buttery, right, and soft. It's not flaky at all. And so really the ingredients aren't very much different from a pie crust. But the thing is, is I've added sugar. Shortbread is sweet and because, you know, it, I mean, shortbread is a little bit flaky, right? It's a little crumbly, I guess. And so the sugar will help sort of keep that gluten formation in check so it's not too tough. But also the butter is warm. That's pretty much the only difference. And some recipes will say, have your butter as spreadable as mayonnaise if you're making a shortbread. So this is a cup of flour, a quarter cup of sugar, and then a pinch of salt, and then a stick of butter, just like we did for the, I'm um, add a little vanilla later. Um, and so then I'm just going to mix this, and it's fine for me to work it. It's fine for it to be warm. At this point, we want the fat to slowly melt out, right? And then so it'll still surround gluten molecules and make it not as tough as bread, but it'll be all melty and moist and good shortbread. And in this case, all we're doing is just inhibiting bonds with water and also the reason it's called shortbread, or sh why Crisco is called shortening, is because when fat inhibits bonds between flour and water and gluten, it shortens gluten chains. That's why it's called shortening. So we do want the gluten, we just don't want the long gluten. We're shortening it. And working the butter, as you can see, as the butter gets warmer, everything's getting moister, everything's holding together a little bit better. And we may need a little water or milk or something more fatty, which I don't have, but it's like a teaspoon. This is the same reason that a cake baked with oil will always be moister than a cake made with butter. Because oil has less water in it, number one, and number two can readily absorb and form itself around all the water and there's no gluten network developed at all. So if you want a cake that's really flavorful and kind of dense and good with tea, make it with butter. But if you want like a beautiful birthday cake that's nice and fluffy and moist, you make it with oil. But isn't it fascinating that they have virtually the same ingredients. It's just the temperature of the fat that makes the character so different. I brought some almonds to put on top, because why not go all the way? If you're going to do something, do it right. We'll pop that sucker in the oven and have a treat, hopefully, before you go home. Nice and messy. My grandfather used to say, if you're not covered in dirt or flour, you're not doing anything, which I really like. Okay. So moistness, fat inhibiting bonds with water. We went over that, shortening gluten chains. Fat is used, but used warm, so water can release into the dough, build some gluten, but the fat still present will shorten the gluten networks. Okay, tenderization, kind of the same principle. Fat melting out slowly will baste a food item. Um, it has its own moistness from lipid viscosity, but it creates a tenderizing effect um, by infusing foods. So a perfect example that's not related to pastry is like when you're cooking meat, right? So if uh, I took a class from a French butcher like about a year ago and he was talking about cutting roasts from a pork animal and we were talking about, oh, I'm sure you slow cook that because it's from the shoulder or something, it's very tough. And they said, oh no, we cook it at 450 degrees with the lid off. And uh, I started thinking about it and I thought, well, sure, of course, because it has a fat cap about this big on top of it you can stick that thing in the oven, put a little bit of water in the bottom, and at a high temperature, the fat will melt and slowly drip 
down the sides of the roast and baste the piece of meat. And even though you're cooking it at a high temperature, you can cook it for a long time and it won't be overcooked, right? And, you know, I tried it. I went home immediately and tried it. And out came after like an hour and a half of roasting at 450 degrees without the top on this beautiful pork shoulder roast that was not overcooked, nice and semi-rare in the center because that's how I like my pork. Um, and then we had these beautiful crispy potatoes that the fat had dripped down onto and this really nice crust on the top. Um, so that's a perfect example of how the fat slowly renders, right, and bastes the meat or tenderizes it. Um, even if it is a very tough cut indeed. So if that's the case, you would use like vegetable oil? Yeah, I mean in general I would use a neutral oil. So back to this olive oil thing, if you don't want the, the fat to be the thing that flavors the food, you want to use something milder. My go-to for vegetable oil that's not super refined, that that's neutral, is sunflower oil. Um, Safflower oil is good too. It's got one of the highest smoke points of any of the vegetable fats. So that might be appealing to you if you want to fry in a neutral oil. You usually want to fry in a neutral oil. Um, and we're going to use some sunflower oil in a second to make mayonnaise. Peanut oil, they always tell you to high temperature fry in peanut oil. Yeah, I don't use a lot of peanut oil, and I can't remember why. I feel like I heard something along the way about the makeup of its unsaturated fats or something, or its tendency towards free radicals. I, I don't know what it is. I can look it up and let you know, um, but I don't, I don't know why I steered away from it after some time. I steered away from canola oil largely because of the way it's grown. A lot of the way that canola is grown um, is just concerning to me, um, and genetically modified canola is really common. Um, it does have a nice taste. Mm -hmm. The thing about sunflower oil that I learned is that it's it's like it's got two saturated fats that ma it makes up, and then the other two unsaturated fats in its makeup are actually contributing to omega six and omega threes in our diet. So it's a very healthy fat overall, particularly the high oleic sunflower oil because it's got a high omega I guess omega six or omega three I don't remember one of the other is going to be higher in a high oleic sunflower than in just a standard sunflower oil. Let's go to lightness really fast because it kind of goes into the cake category where we were at. So even though we don't associate with fat, fat with lightness usually, it's actually a huge tool that we have in leavening because it will, it will trap those lipid packages can trap air and they can also trap other molecules to provide some lift in the foods. And so in really traditional, some really traditional pastries, we don't use chemical leaveners at all, like baking sodas or baking powers, powders. We completely depend on whipping fat into the baked good in order to leaven the item. So if you, you know, um, are making cookies, perfect example, making cookies. My son, he'll be like, oh, well, it doesn't matter. We'll just put the frozen butter in there and make some cookies. And I'm like, son, it's not going to work. You know, the butter has to be soft. And not only does the butter have to be soft, you have to cream it, right, with the sugar. And the recipe will say, cream five to seven minutes. And you're like, oh, please, I can stir it. It's nice and mushy, I'm done. But the point of that creaming phase and making cakes and making cookies is you're actually whipping air. And the fat in the butter is, that's nice and soft and available is trapping the air and you're getting lift, all right? So even if you have used all the best ingredients and you got your recipe refined and you don't cream the sugar and the butter long enough, the cookies will be flat. And it doesn't matter if the baking soda or baking powder were measured perfectly. Chemical leaveners won't make up for the leavening that you can get by whipping fat properly. Did that explain why one time I do my Toll House cookies and they're nice and chewy and the next time they're like cake? Yeah, probably. Either that or you left out the chemical leavener and didn't cream the, you know what I mean? Uh, it could also be if you left out salt. So, you know, chewiness can, is attributable sometimes to gluten formation, right? And we know that salt is, is helpful to gluten formation. So all that chemistry is coming together. But this is the other reason why when you're making a cake, it'll say add the eggs one at a time, beating after each addition. Fold in the egg whites, fold in the dry ingredients. You don't want to beat them in super fast. You want them to be night. You want them to be room temperature. Our egg, when we make brownies, have you ever seen the recipe in the Joy of Cooking that says your, your eggs have to be at room temperature when you make your brownies? That's because the fat is nice and warm and it can go in there and surround all the little air bubbles and make a better leavened product, right? So 
the slow and methodical making of a cake is much better than the throwing of everything into the bowl and then beating it to death. You want to beat it at a moderate speed for a length of time um, in order to build that leavening. Yeah. Does any of this change if you're using gluten-free uh, flour and things like that? I'm sure it does because probably not. I mean, probably you should take to heart the leavening part because really what we're doing there mostly with fats is trapping air and that's not going to be affected by gluten-free medium. But in terms of building gluten networks, you know, you don't really have to worry about that and you'll probably be using other things to affect texture. Right. Yeah. But in general, I mean, fat in and of itself is moist, is creamy. So if you're going for moist, creamy baked goods, you know, you're going to have to have a fat component in there for sure. Does that help? <laughs> and I would be interested to see the chemistry on that. You know, I'm sure it depends on the type of flour that you're using. Um, you know, because, you know, nut flours are very high in protein as opposed to, you know, some of the other gluten-free flours. And I'm sure that there is some of the same thing going on there where the fat is inhibiting some bonds between proteins and water, which is maybe giving you the desired result, you know. Good question. That's something I should look into more. The timing matters and the temperature matters when we're leavening baked goods or other, or making whipped cream, for example. You always hear that you want the cream to be very, very cold when you're whipping it because it turns out you trap air better when you're whipping cream if it's very, very cold. And then conversely, when you're creaming butter and sugar, you want it to be room temperature. You want everything to be very, very warm or room temp, I guess, not too hot. Because we all know that if we, if we try to hurriedly melt, uh, soften our butter for cookies and we melt it instead, then we also get the flat because you can't, the melted butter obviously is not going to as easily entrap water molecules as a fluffy creamed softened butter. Okay, so then I wanted to go into creaminess as the last bit, and then we're going to make an emulsification, and we'll have some time for you guys to get up and work on it because it takes a lot of beating, and I'm not going to do it all. I used to make my mayonnaise in a food processor, but then when I got back to Roots and started making it by hand, I never went back to the food processor because it's all about slowly incorporating the fat into the egg um, because, so basically... We should go back to emulsifiers really fast. So there's different glyceride molecules that are considered emulsifiers, and that means that they have both polar and nonpolar charging sites on the molecule so that they can bond with water, which is polar, and they can also bond with fat, which is nonpolar. And so that they can help these two things, which don't normally come together, come together. And so that's where we get like vinaigrettes, this is where we get butter, this is where we get mayonnaise. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of artificial emulsifiers in our foods. Um, you know, I think it's like gums um, that may be natural, but they do, I think they do interfere with like your gut microbiology a little bit. So you have to be careful about some of the human manipulated emulsifiers that are in processed foods. But in the kitchen, there are things that are natural emulsifiers like egg, mustard, I think parsley brings things together a little bit. Honey is an emulsifier. Um, so you can use things like that, you know, in your salad dressings and in your sauces to uh, pr promote bonding between water, usually, and then things that aren't normally soluble in water, and in this case, fat. Um, and so the rule of thumb for making really good homemade mayonnaise is per egg yolk, you need three-quarter cups of oil. And so that's going to... I mean, a lot of people do make their mayonnaise with olive oil, but I find that olive oil is too flavored. Um, and, I, you know, I may be able to find a really nice, well-produced, not old and rancid olive oil that I'd be willing to use in mayonnaise, but I so far haven't found it, and so I do use sunflower oil. Um, I also have created blends before, like half sunflower, half olive oil, but I still found it was a little too much flavored, like the fat, for me. Um, a lot of people also use grapeseed oil for, for mayonnaise, and I actually believe that vegan mayonnaise is primarily made with grapeseed oil. For some reason, I'm not sure. So the egg yolk should be room temperature um, so that, those, so that the, the emulsifying can happen more easily. Um, and so then you want to get, and it's better to have like a towel. That's why I brought that. So I'll get like a, just a regular old kitchen towel, doesn't have to be pretty, and make a little nest with it. 
and then fit my bowl down into that so that it's not sliding around and I have both hands free. And then I'm going to just very, very slowly, that's the key with this, drip in the sunflower oil and whisking the entire time. So it takes a while. But what you'll find as you go is that it is so unbelievably stiff and creamy. When you make it in the food processor, it's like, eh, kind of creamy. If you add whey or something, you'll get a little bit more stiffness. And it'll be more liquidy. But if you take the time to put it together by hand, you won't regret it. And then the thing that gives mayonnaise its flavor is really lemon juice and salt. So creating the emulsion is really just a trick of technique. And then you can, as, as we've all experienced in this class, it's very subjective. So you can decide how much salt and how much lemon juice goes into your finished product. Does anybody want to try? Come on. If I wasn't trying to make eye contact with you and talk, I would be trying to go drop by drop. I don't need a steady stream, I just need... You see it thickening there? Oh goodness, Harry, you better set that down. So Ooh, girl. Too much. <laughs> Learning to drop it out. Well, that's the thing. Maybe stop dropping for a second since you had a plop and just whisk like mad for a second. Have you changed up or tend to go just to one I just direction? go in one direction. And if you find it starting to break, right, to where the you can see the oil separating from the egg yolk, just stop pouring oil in. Try to whisk it like crazy if you can. You can add a little salt to it if you want. That might help. And just keep going. And if it's just not going well at all, you can actually take the mixture that you've made, that you've ruined, you can heat it up. And then you can, add, you can start over again, essentially dropping that mixture mm -hmm. into a new egg yolk and whisk, whisking, 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 and trying to fix it, okay? But you just constantly have to be asking yourself, like, is this going well, you know? And if it's not going well, you have to adjust. Otherwise, it's going to go south pretty so fast. So is it separating or not? No, 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 it looks fine. Now, now just go back in with your oil and just try to be real gentle with your tilt there. Oh, wait. You show me how much you put in because I couldn't really tell. And then I'll try Oh my gosh. Reba. That's a really good exercise in patience. It's really hard not to want to do a figure eight. Well, I think if you did a figure eight, you would, you would have to drop your oil in even slower. Does anybody else want to try? Someone else has hey, to try. I want you to feel what it feels like when it's getting nice and stiff. It's so gratifying. <laughs> and all you're doing is basically just forcing two things that don't want to dissolve into one another to actually at least bond together for a moment, you know. With egg yolk and with oil, because, because um, oil is naturally viscous and because egg yolk is itself an emulsifier, you get a pretty stable emulsification. But when it comes to like, yeah, good job. When it comes to like vinegar and oil, you'll see like if you make a vinaigrette, that emulsion will break and then reform and break and then reform because the bonds are very weak. Someone else who's better with their left hand, come get it. <laughs> you can put the, the lemon juice in at that point, but it, it usually won't. But the more water, you can add water, for example, if you find that your emulsion's getting too thick. But so like if you're, if you're going for that stiffness and creaminess, if you add the lemon juice ahead of time, it's going to take you longer to get there because you're adding more liquid into the medium. Same principle. So if you're making a balsamic or something and say you want to make it into like a vinaigrette that you can sort of like slather onto like a loin of meat or some piece of meat and you want it to be thicker, you can use the same principle. Just introduce the, the oil. A good rule of thumb is um, like for a cup of olive oil, which would be a lot a third a cup of, of vinegar, okay? So about a third the amount of vinegar that you're using to oil will produce a decent vinaigrette. And so you can just get your vinegar in there. And usually I like to cut like shallot or garlic and let it rest in the vinegar for at least 10 minutes before I start introducing the oil because that's gonna let those flavors really meld together. And actually we learned in our alliums class with Pat Battle that shallot has twice, it's twice as good for you as onion. It has more enzymes, but you have to cut it and let it be exposed to the air for a little bit for those enzymes to develop. And then you let it macerate in the, the acid, the vinegar, which we'll talk about in the acid class. 
Um, and then drop the oil in slowly and you'll get a creamy or thicker vinaigrette. So yeah, I think I read something about slicing your onions and putting them in the sunshine. Oh, really? I think that's probably what it is. It's like that enzyme development because as those like exposed bonds are like, ooh, what's up here? And they bond with things and they react and they create healthful... Are just, the, just the opposite of onions because you're not supposed to let onions be in the air. Not at all. Is it getting thicker? It's nice tell. and creamy. It's not even looking like it's getting to be any more. Does it ever get to look like it's oh, more? Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm waiting for that moment when it just like turns stiffer. So you're going to be like so excited. How's it going? It's going. Anybody else want to relieve her, or are you good? You feeling good? Mona, you just want your fat to be saturated, right, if you're making pastry with it, because... Why does lard have a bad rap? Because of the war against saturated fats for such a long time, and then also the continuing war on meat, you know, I think... But it's, um, it's quite helpful. It's actually full of vitamin D. <laughs> so it's a great way to get vitamin D other than going out in the sun or taking a little pill. You know, and I'm sure the manufacturer of those pills is super ethical. I mean, who knows, right? Like, like we haven't delved into like how they make all the little supplements that we take in order to be like good citizens, right? But who knows what's in your supplements or whether or not you should actually be taking them or whether or not your body can absorb them in that way. When you um, see in the market things like fat-free cottage cheese and fat-free yogurt, I'm oh. assuming they're using some chemical. Yeah. Yeah, or they're just lifting fat out of the product. But in order to do that, they have to do some pretty aggressive homogenization, which has its own like host of health concerns, you know. Um, I mean, I, I eat full-fat dairy if I'm going to eat dairy, you know. Um, and I... I started on that when my kids were young and they would say, oh, give your kid whole milk. And not only does it taste better, but it's better for developing their stomach lining and for sealing their gut and all those kinds of things. Wick won't let you get to anything but 2% milk or below. Well, Wick is very heavily influenced by the dairy lobby. So you can imagine. Do you know how much dairy you can get on Wick? It's ridiculous. How many gallons of milk? I think they're allowed to buy 16 up to 16 gallons of milk like a week or something as a family of Wick, that's a lot of milk. And most of the milk that's approved for Wick, you can bet your bottom dollar it's not full fat and it's certainly ultra pasteurized and it's certainly homogenized, <laughs> you know, and it's definitely not organic. So my dough is a little sticky, but. Maybe because it didn't actually chill. What's that? Well, we don't have anything to fill it with, but we're going to... <laughs> garlic pie. Are there any other questions? At this point, we're just sort of like finishing our project. You can worry about anything getting rancid, particularly unsat things that have high levels of unsaturated fats in them because there's more free fatty acids in there that are going to be bonding to other things, right? So they could be bonding to things that rancidify it. You know, they're more susceptible to oxidation, right? So uh, trading ions on the surfaces and causing discoloration and off flavors. So you certainly have to worry about it going rancid, but not quite as easily, say, maybe as as like a walnut oil or something. It's just, it's all about the composition of the fat. And you can look it up, you know, just look up. That's why they say for, for a lot of the oils, like walnut oil, avocado oil, those really sort of volatile ones to keep them in the fridge so that they are, um, I don't have anything to put in here to like weigh it down. So it's probably gonna fall into the pan. That's okay. The point is just that it, hopefully it'll be flaky. Excuse me, sorry, I'm going to open this oven.
I think our shortbread's done. Oh, it's getting yeah. thick now. Yeah. It's getting thick. Anybody else? Still got a lot of oil left. It's getting thick now. This is not the prettiest shortbread you've ever seen, but that's okay. How do you make ghee? Great question. So ghee is clarified butter, and it's butter that's been gently heated so that the milk solids in it lift to the top, and they can be skimmed off um, or sieved out or mechanically removed. And so that kind of, it does several things. It changes the flavor of the fat. It makes it palatable or digestible to people who have a lactose problem. And it also raises the smoke point. So ghee actually has that like clarified butter has a higher smoke point than regular butter. So you can do higher heat cooking in it, which is why it's associated with, you know, searing and other types of cooking in India and Eastern countries. Um, we're gonna let this cool a little bit more, but then you guys can dig into it. So clarified butter and ghee are the same thing? Pretty much, yeah. What about avocado oil? What could you use it for mayonnaise? Yeah, you could use it for mayonnaise. I just found that it's so much more expensive than some of the other neutral oils, you know, that I might use. Like, some of those oils I'll only use for dressings or raw purposes if I really want to, like, add a little oomph to flavor-wise to the food, right? So... Uh, one of the things we didn't talk about that's, that's often really helpful is if you layer your fats when you're cooking. So you're using more than one type of fat throughout the cooking process. So this is why we'll, you know, maybe make our, if we want a really moist cake, we'll make it with oil, but then we might put a buttercream frosting on it, right? So we're having the play of the different textures and the different flavors together. Um, and so, you know, similarly, you might make a nice soup. Um, and then you might finish it with a raw oil that complements the flavor of that soup. And so that's what I'm using like avocado oil. I'm using it for dressings and garnishes. Same with walnut oil. Um, sesame oil, I almost always add at the end because it has a generally sort of, especially if it's already toasted, toasted sesame oil has a lower smoke point. So it's not something you want to actually cook in, it's a flavoring oil. Um, actually, sesame oil that hasn't been toasted already has a fairly high smoke point. So if you do want to use it for cooking, stir fries. So like wok cooking, the reason it is what it is is because of that big surface area of that pot. You get really high temperatures and the food can be seared and browned really quickly but still maintain its crunch, right? Because it's not going to be cooked all the way through before it gets browned. So you want like a pop and hot pan and really hot fat when you're doing stir fries in a wok and you need neutral oils that can handle really high temperatures like peanut, you know, um, untoasted sesame oil, like unrefined sesame oil, which is not, uh, it's not as easy to find. Neither is scallion oil, which is really nice for Asian food cooking, but you may be able to find it at like an Asian food grocery. But I, I actually looked at Whole Foods as well as the co-op, as well as Ingalls before this class, and I could find walnut, avocado, and toasted sesame oil alongside the olive oil and the coconut oil, but I was not able to find scallion oil or untoasted sesame oil at any of those kind of more common stores. Look at that mayonnaise! Jesus, Woo! this is a lot of work. It is a lot of work. I get up and do it early in the morning. But, you know, do y'all make your own ranch dressing? Oh, I used to hate ranch dressing, and now it's my favorite, one of my favorite things. I'll, you just do one part homemade mayonnaise, one part buttermilk, and then I taught a, I taught a spice blends class a while back, I think the handout's online, but you can make your own ranch blend, or you can buy one. Penzi Spices makes a really nice ranch blend. You just add that dry spice blend to the buttermilk mayonnaise mix. Oh man, it is the best. It's looking really good. Does anybody else want to give it a shot? It's really fun. It's really, really, really fun. You guys hate me for making you make mayonnaise. Does anybody want shortbread? Might be hot, but if you want it, come get it. It is not gluten free. I'm so sorry. So if you give it more width, does it need to add oil to go faster? Have to stay low the whole way through? You might be 
all added a touch faster, but you know, after you've done all that work, you'd be taking a bit of a risk. I don't know who asked that. <laughs> you want me to take over? Yes, I okay. do. Um, I, I'm gonna throw some salt in there. That is thickening up. Yeah. Oh, nice. I do wanna finish it so that y'all will be able to taste it. All right. All right, I'm on it. Would you ever just kind of stick your finger in and taste it? And oh, heck, yeah. Oh, you could. Like, if this was thick enough for you, you could stop if you wanted to. But you just won't get as much volume, right? If you really want, like, a cup of mayonnaise, you're going to need to put the whole three-quarter cup of oil in there. Can you put it on ice? Sure, yeah. But you'll want it to be warm. Again, you want the, the fat... See how it's thickening, it's thickening up? Isn't that so satisfying? Can I, could you just shove that cracker bowl? Thank you. Oh, now that's lovely mayonnaise. It may be a little lemony for some of you, but I like my mayonnaise a little lemony. Come on up and try it. You can dip your bread or your cracker into it. Good. How's the shortbread? <laughs> right on. Huh, interesting. I don't find that garlic over mm -hmm. too overpowering. I don't find any of them overpowering at all. I was surprised where people were. So that's really what I have for you. Um, feel free to keep eating. Feel free to stick around if you want to see the pie crust. It's not really going to be fully cooked through anyways. It would take quite a while. Um, I'm just sort of... You usually cook it to get it ready to cook stuff in. Oh, well, I'll par cook it like this for maybe 15 minutes and then put things in it. Um, the other thing I would say about pie crust, though, is um, often if you brush it with like an egg wash or even like a little sugar, like um, in France, they'll do like a sugar like liquor mix, like cognac or something with a little sugar and egg white. And that actually creates a barrier between the pie crust and the food. Because how many times have you made like a pie or a tart and then the crust gets soggy, yeah. even if you pre-bake it? Um, and so if you make a little glaze for it, something like sugary, eggy, and a little alcoholic, if, if you're going that route, then it creates a little bit of a waterproofing for the crust. And then you can put your, your custard or your fruit or whatever it is inside of it. And if you're making a savory pie, you can actually take um, onion slices. I just recently learned this from a friend of mine onion slices and put them on the bottom of the pie crust and it'll sort of lift the ingredients off of the pie crust and have a similar wow. effect. Anyways, tangent. That's the fat class. Thank you for coming. <laughs>